My object in giving this talk on constant velocity shaft couplings and robotics is to try to show how the papers that I wrote in 1970, which were published in 1973 and 1983, about constant velocity shaft couplings and in parallel ro robotics and parallel robots, respectively, uh, have relevance to the matter in hand here in ABB. And it may be that it would be useful to try to clarify a few points just by going over the points in the, in the papers and just covering them briefly and as far as I can descriptively. The first thing that I want to say is that I was determined in 1970 or somewhere around about then to develop a general theory on constant velocity shaft couplings. I felt confident that this could be done and I believe I succeeded. And the thing that came out of this at the end was uh, a series of couplings that dealt, that dealt with shafts that were parallel to one another and which simply, effect, in effect, they, they allowed the bodies to, the, the shafts to move parallel to one another in any direction you like, maintaining constant relative speed. And this was precisely the same as you would require for a robot, robotic system that allows solely translations. In other words, it would move uh, one body uh, in pure translation relative to another body without any rotation between the bodies. Uh, three degrees of freedom of translation. And that is what one needs in a constant velocity shaft coupling between parallel shafts. Now, I'll come on to a model of such a coupling in a few minutes, which in any case is described in the film that was made in 1973 about constant velocity shaft coupling, which should be viewed in connection uh, with this video. So now let me start on, on matters of principle to begin with. Let's, and I have drawn up here on the board simply two bodies, body one and body two. And if those bodies are completely unconnected, then body two has six degrees of freedom with respect to body one. There is no constraint whatever on the movement of body two relative to body one. But if we want to, we can gradually restrict the motion of body two in relation to body one. For example, one can make body two touch body one at one point, and that would restrict its freedom from six to five, two points restricted from six to four, and so on, until eventually if it touches body one at six distinct points, we can expect the freedom of body two relative to body one to be re to reduced to zero, provided those six contact points were maintained. It doesn't always work that way because one can get special uh, patterns of contact where uh, the rules, the general rules don't apply, but I don't want to get involved uh, with that at the moment. So if I were to connect a body two to body one by, say, six hinges, f sorry, five hinges, and I just simply represent the hinges in, by little lines like this, any how I like, and think that they're connected up with one another by some means, one, two, three, four, five hinges, this first hinge being rigidly connected to body one, and this one being rigidly connected to body two, then that body two has now, by virtue of these five hinges, one, two, three, four, five, lost one freedom with respect to body one. Exactly what form that loss of freedom takes will depend upon the relative positions of these five hinges. And uh, as I intend to convey by means of this sort of diagrammatic shading of the bodies is to indicate that everything I draw on the blackboard is three-dimensional. There's no suggestion that these five bearings, these five uh, hinges, sh shafts, or whatever you like to call them, taking rotations, there's no suggestion that those should be parallel to one another, intersect one another, 
or have any special relationship with one another. They are perfectly generally arranged in three dimensions, uh, placed and pointing in, in general directions. And then we can say that the body, too, has lost one freedom. Uh, in other words, it has its freedom reduced from six to five relative to body one. If I were to add a second chain with five, I'm not going to draw it in, just the same as the first one, then that will reduce the freedom of body two relative to body one one more. In other words, it will reduce it to five by virtue of the first chain, to four by virtue of the second, and so on. The third chain would reduce it to three. And it's that particular thing that we're interested in. We have two bodies connected together, and each of the bodies has five single freedom joints in it. Each of the, each of the connecting chains has five single freedom joints uh, in it. And this is exactly what is said in the 1983 paper about in parallel connected robots, which I'm not going to hold up for you, but in the table there, which is labeled table one, if you look to the bottom, and you see that the first column talks about the order of the screw system and the sixth screw system, which is the bottom entry, is the general one. And you'll see that in the second line there, if we want to have three freedoms, because you'll see the second column goes up from two, three, four, five, and six, if you want to have three freedoms, you'd have to have 15 joints, which is exactly what you get here with three connecting chains of five joints, each five single freedom joints each. And you see in the final column of that table, the fourth column, you will see that the first entry opposite that has simply got five, five, five in it, which means that there are three connecting chains, each of which has to have five freedoms. And that is a symmetrical arrangement which gives the body two three freedoms with relation to body one. And that's what the entry says. We could, if we liked, have chosen unsymmetrical arrangements uh, uh, for that, but I, that doesn't necessarily confirm us now. The important thing in all of them is that the sum of the freedoms of the joints in each chain, sorry, the sum of the freedom of the joints in all three chains should add up to 15, and that those chains should be independent of one another, and that uh, the, the, the actual hinges in each chain should uh, be uh, not be specially orientated, but generally orientated. So we have that arrangement there. Now, the, if we did have those bodies connected up to one another, then uh, that means that we could actuate suitable joints in that, in order, uh, that arrangement in order to manipulate one body relative to the other with three degrees of freedom, which is precisely what we are trying to aim at in the, in the, in the, the end point of all this. Now, what I want to show now is the model here of a constant velocity shaft coupling, which incorporates that principle of five joints. And let me just move this to the center here and hope that the thing doesn't come out of adjustment while I am doing it and show on the screen, I hope it will come out, if you can direct the camera down to this, to this model, that if I turn the handle, I will get one shaft going the same speed as the other. Now, what does that actually mean? Because I can move the shafts to a different position relative to one another, and the coupling will still work, uh, and, uh, turn, uh, and the two shafts will turn at the same speed. If I tried to turn one shaft round by pushing it, pushing the, the housing, the bearing in which it sits, then you see the other one stays parallel. Okay, there's a bit of a slop in, in, in the bearings. Well, that's just because there are so many joints and, and uh, it's not exactly made as a piece of precision engineering, but as a piece of, uh, of something to demonstrate the principle. Now, of course, here I'm involved with rotation of shafts at both the input and the output here, that was the object of that exercise about constant velocity shaft couplings. But if I now take these shafts out of their bearings, they should come out fairly easily, uh, lift them up out of the bearings, and hold them quite freely. That's one just about out now. Where are we? hope I don't need any help here, but still we'll get it out. 
Come on. That's right, you might better help me here. There we are, let's got that out. Now, I don't want to move that. I want to get this out, try and get it out gently, if you can. There, that's fine. Now, we can here, if we like, completely forget about the idea of shafts. I can think of one hand here, of mine, being equivalent to a body one, and the other hand being equivalent to body two. If you look here, you'll see that the connections between the two have each got five hinges in them, and let me try to point them out to you. On one of the chains, they're all the, all the chains are the same. There's one hinge here at the end there, and you might be able to see that that rotates as I, as I lift it up. There are three hinges in the middle chain that go zigzag like that, one, two, three, and there's another hinge just like the first one, at the right-hand joint there, which I think you can see turning around there with any luck. So that there are five connecting chains between body one and body two, and body two, now relative to body one, if I hold my left hand firm, I can move it in this direction, I can move it in that direction, and I can move it in this direction. In other words, it has complete freedom to translate a limited amount in any direction I choose, any combination of those three coordinate directions. So, in a sense then, or precisely, if you like, that arrangement is a, a three-freedom robot structure within parallel con connections which will maintain a body here in pure translation relative to a body here. The shafts now become irrelevant. The fact that the shafts are parallel to one another here is something that's important for shaft couplings, but I can simply, f I could cut those shafts off and just have generally shaped bodies in either of my two hands. And of course, the relative movement between the two ends there is going to be just the same then as it would be if I, as with the shafts. And I have, I've got myself back to a, to a diagram that relates, relates to that one. Now, I should say that when I was working on these constant velocity shaft couplings back in 1970 or so, that the um, idea of a shaft coupling was really, I thought, it was just between shafts that intersected, intersected one another, which is the common idea of a shaft coupling in automobiles, in all sorts of machinery, which transmit uniform speed from one shaft to another, uh, and they're called constant velocity shaft couplings for intersecting shafts. What surprised me was, when I was working on this, that it very soon became apparent that, and rather um, as a surprise bonus, if you like, that I could come up with constant velocity shaft couplings which did not intersect one another at any finite point. Those two shafts are parallel, they intersect one another at an infinite distance away. And so uh, that, I found, was an interesting thing. And in the table, in the paper that I wrote then, in, uh, which was published in 1973, and here it is, but I'll come back to that again later, uh, there are the various categories of constant velocity shaft coupling between parallel shafts, which are uh, really exactly the same as the patterns of couplings that you can have between two bodies, irrespective of the shafts that they connect. We can forget about the shafts and think of the diagram as being this, with a body here and a body there, with precisely the same connection arrangement between them. So now, uh, let's examine what conditions we need in order that the two bodies connected together shall be in pure relative translation. The body two will be unable to rotate about any axis relative to body one. It, all it can do is to translate bodily in any direction we choose. Well, uh, if you go into the detail then of screw theory, you'll find that the condition a, a, a vital condition that has to be satisfied here is that the three axes, if these are pure hinges along there, 
though, sorry, not the, the five axes, if those are, those are uh, hinges along there, have all got to lie parallel to a plane, any plane. They've got to lie parallel to a plane. Now, what I've shown in the top picture on the right-hand side of the board here is five hinges, just diagrammatically represented, which are all parallel to this plane. In other words, I can project them onto that plane, and uh, these lines on the plane here are supposed to be parallel to the hinges, and I've done it with all five of them, so that those hinges all lie parallel to the plane. Now, suppose I have body one here, one, I'll just call it there, I can connect that up to the first hinge, I could connect that up to the second hinge, I could connect that up to the third hinge, this up to the fourth, that up to the fifth, and this to the second body. And I could say that although that body has, uh, has got five freedoms, at least uh, one of the freedoms is going to be pure translation in a direction perpendicular to that plane relative to body one. But as soon as I move body two a bit relative to body one in pure translation, these hinges are going to change their orientation. At least the middle three are going to change their orientation. They're going to turn around the others. So as soon as I move that a little bit relative to body one, these three middle hinges are going to shift around and there will be no plane which, uh, to, which they are to which they lie parallel. And so I can only say that this gives me pure translation, a condition for pure translation of body two relative to body one. It only works uh, as a component chain in here when I uh, move this a very small, or in theory, an infinitesimal distance uh, relative to body one. And of course, I would then need to have three such chains as that, but it would only, to, to fill, to get the freedom down to three, but it would only work infinitesimally. I could have different planes, I'd need to have different planes for all the three chains. But now, let us see what we can do in order to make sure that when we do connect body one to body two, the hinges themselves do remain parallel to a certain plane, even when I displace body two finitely. And one way of doing that is to say, all right, I shall make quite certain that the first two hinges here and there are parallel to one another. And then the lines in the plane, if I project them, will be parallel to one another too. And then the remaining three hinges here also are parallel to one another. And again, the lines in the plane there are parallel to one another when they're projected back onto that plane, perpendicularly onto that plane. So now I can, if I connect these together like I did before, and say if this is body one, uh, and I join this up to hinge one, and I join that straight into hinge two there, I am automatically ensuring that because this is a direct connection between hinges one and two, that hinge two will always remain pointing in the same direction relative to, to hinge one, so that those two will remain parallel with one another. Likewise, uh, I, I can have my body here, and I can connect that up to hinge five there and work my way back and connect that up to hinge four and this up uh, to hinge three. And here again, if they start parallel, when one rotates about the other, uh, then they are bound to remain parallel with one another. So I've got three parallel there in the right-hand group, and I have two parallel in the left-hand group, and they will remain parallel uh, even if I were to deform the bodies, uh, move the bodies relative to one another a finite amount. So all I need to do now is to connect up 
the two missing ones and to get across from one set of parallel ones to the other. So that I can immediately say then that there will always be a plane here between these two because by, by putting this link in here, I am not altering the angle between those two hinges. They, that remains the same. So I can move that finitely and uh, I will always find that there is going to be a plane between this, this, uh, this side and the other side uh, to which all five hinges are parallel even if I move those bodies a finite amount, body, body two relative to body one by a finite amount. And that then is the principle of the constant velocity shaft coupling, uh, provided I have three such chains quite independent of one another, uh, with, um, uh, with two hinges parallel on the one hand and three hinges parallel on the other hand. And of course, this picture shows and I meant to show this, that the two hinges that are parallel to one another are on one side of the plane and the others are on the other side of the plane. But that doesn't matter a hoot because I could move this whole plane over and I could put it anywhere provided I remain, it remains parallel to itself and I could zigzag these around on either side of the plane. It just Theoretically, it does not matter at all where the plane is, provided that that plane is existed, because we are projecting perpendicular to it, perpendicularly to it, and there's no significance in that plane lying in any particular position between the hinges that I've drawn there on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. It's quite uh, uh, quite irrelevant to the to the to the principle of, of the thing. So I've now established a means now of making a constant velocity shaft coupling. And if one looks at this table now, and I don't want to go into any detail with it particularly, the, the actual class of coupling to which, the, to which that, that model belongs is the one in the middle. And you may just see there that there are two things in brackets, two, two entries up I'll try and hold this so that the camera can get it. There are two entries in brackets there, two uh, en entries in brackets there. Then we jump, shunt down, and we have three there. So that indicates that there are two joints on one side of, as it were, uh, parallel to one another, and there are three on the other. So I would then say that if I wanted to, I've got R... I have an R here that is parallel to another R on that side. That symbol means parallel. Likewise, I have R parallel to R parallel to R on that side. And I, on that table, we also have something else that shows the relationship to the shafts on either side there. But that no longer need concern us because I haven't got shafts. We've just got the two bodies, and we're not specifying any particular axis of the shafts at all. They're just bodies just like, like the ones I started with up in the top left-hand corner of the board. But now the fact remains that these, that set of two R's there, which are parallel to one another, and that set of two R's there that are parallel to one another, must not be parallel to one another. In other words, I must not have a parallel sign in the middle there because that means they're all parallel to one another. So I've got to make sure that those are angled to one another, which is represented by an angle form like that. So that is a sort of symbolic representation of this picture. Two turning joints, or rotational joints, revolute joints, whatever you like to call them, parallel to one another, three parallel to one another, and the two sets do not make are not parallel to one another, they have to make some angle that is not zero uh, to one another. And quite possibly, the most sensible answer would be to make them at right angles to one another. And for that, I have a symbol uh, like, like that. Now, it's also possible to substitute other joints in amongst all this, such as a screw nut joint, and also, perhaps one 
uh, could be a prismatic joint, a joint that will that slides. And uh, for example, I could put a sliding joint in here instead of that one there. And, uh, so at least that shows that that shows that you could put a prismatic joint or a pure sliding joint in in place of one or other of these R's. But you've got to be very careful about how many you put in. And it was seen to be sensible to to have preference for turning joints anyway. And screw joints are put in that paper as uh, for completeness. I have tried in that table to put in all conceivable possibilities, all permutations and combinations of joints, even though from the point of view of being realistic, uh, you would not adopt some of those suggestions. But at least theoretically, they are possible. And I have tried in that, in the, in that table to include all of them. But now, uh, what happens, say, if I ha make an alteration to one of these chains? For example, if you see on, on, on the left-hand side here, I've got, um, uh, I've got uh, two R's, uh, R1, let's, let's call them R1, R2, R3, R4, R4, R4 and R5, if we like. Um, I have got there, um, I've got a, two groups, one and two in one group, and three, four, and five in another group. But suppose now I've got three chains now, I've connected, I just like this coupling here, I've got three of them. If you look carefully at this, you'll see, and go back to it, you'll see that that coupling does not conform to the picture I've drawn on the board, because the, the three joints that are parallel to one another in the middle are in the middle. Can you see what I mean? Uh, there's, uh, can you hold that for me? Just for a moment, just perhaps you can hold it and hold it up in the air so that the camera can get it, that uh, those three there, there, and there are hinges that are parallel to one another, but the other two are parallel to one another too, those two, but they're not adjacent to one another. Now, we can imagine ourselves, if you like, pushing one of those R joints over to the other end here, so that we have a connection then that looks R1, with some angle now to R3 parallel to R4 parallel to R5, but now making another angle with R2, but nevertheless such that R1 and R2 are parallel to one another. Now, the intriguing thing is that if we did that for one chain out of the three and left the other two just like they were there, we would still get this, this thing functioning and only allowing pure translation, uh, provided that one has made care, taken great care that when assembling it, these two were parallel to one another, they stay parallel to one another just like they do in that model of a, of a, of a shaft coupling down there. Now, uh, the, the point about this is that I can then say, all right, let's do that to all three chains and have them separated like this on a symmetrical basis, if you like, by having the three parallel ones in the middle. And at either end, there are two more, but they are arranged parallel to one another when one assembles it. That is the arrangement for this coupling. It's got a, sum, a certain amount of symmetry as a result of that, but it's not... not not critical. Now, that, 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 that coupling arranged in that form with all three connecting chains like that uh, comes, is, this, uh, let's just, let me just write this down. This is class B in the table. Class B, I'll simply say table two. And I'll simply put 1973 against that because that's, the, that's the, the date of the paper in question, which I think there's no ambiguity about anyway. Now, this one is going to be class A. And that's, that's in table two. And we can see from that model 
that um, that 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 then um, uh, restricts. If you have three of those chains like that, then that will restrict the two bodies to move in pure translation. If you start off with the two shafts parallel, they remain parallel. Uh, and but we're not worried about the shafts here. We're only worried about the bodies. They will only be able to move in translation. Well, this still doesn't exhaust all the possibilities, because I could, I could uh, split the R's, the, these as well here, and I could have R go back to R one R. No, how, how do we better do it? I think we better go better go R three, R four. And make those parallel to one another. Then we have R1, R2, which we make parallel to one another. And we make them, these two, making an angle with one another. And finally, uh, we have to go back and put R5 on here, making an angle and make sure when we assemble the whole thing that R5 and the combination of R1, R3 and R4 uh, are parallel to one another. Now you'll see here that I have simply tried to maintain the same numbering here. It's always R3, R4 and R5 that are parallel to one another in a group of three, R3, R4, R5. It is always R1 and R2 that are parallel to one another in a group of two. And I think that's exactly the same as I've done up there. there it might be thought to be more consistent simply to number them R1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right across these couplings. But just for the sake of consistency, I've done it this way so that we can relate the particular R pairs to the ones I started with. Now we'll find that this one that I've just uh, just drawn up there um, is is going to be class C in table 2. And so we've got all three classes. How's the film going? Good. Well, now we continue. And I should go back to class A just for a moment, because although I've shown those having angles between them, a general angle not parallel, I could, of course, just as I had before, put right angles in there. The logical, sensible thing to do from a design point of view in that chain would be to make that, that angle a right angle, which is precisely what is the case with the constant velocity shaft coupling model uh, there. They don't intersect at right angles quite, but they are at right angles, the two end, end hinges. And likewise, I would, if I was to design this, I'd almost certainly prefer, prefer, prefer to have the angles, not just any old angle, not parallel, but make those angles right angle. Well, now you'll see that there is another permutation which we can make out of all this, and that is, for example, to switch, um, let me just see what the best way to do it would be. To switch um, these round, so I would have, I wouldn't want R3, uh, 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 I'd put, uh, let's switch round uh, R2 and R4, so I have R2, R3, R2. Now, what have we got to do? I want to try. I want to try to alternate between one group and another. Now, let's say R4, R1, and R5. Now, clearly, that is another alternative combination that I could have. Uh, to join these five hinges up. But now you see, I would want to li line them up so that R3 and R4 are parallel to one another, because that's what they were originally, and R4 and R5 are parallel to one another. 
And I could do it. I could line it up so that this was so. And finally, that R1 and R2 are parallel to one another. So I could get a coupling here made up with R3, R4, and R5 parallel to one another here, as I've shown at the bottom, and R1 and R2 parallel to one another. And uh, I would say, all right, that I have three chains like that, and I'll join them up between body one and body two. And what happens? Well, of course, that works instant. It works for a small infinitesimal displacement, just as that one up there works for an infinitesimal one between body and two. If I tripled up this one where they're all parallel to one plane, too. But as soon as I move this, there's nothing to guarantee that R3 and R4 will remain parallel. There's nothing to guarantee that R4 and R5 will remain parallel. There's nothing to guarantee that R1 and R2 will remain parallel. So while that is a permutation that is clearly possible for all these things, all these joints, that is not admissible so far as table one is concerned. We can't classify it. It just simply does not work as a as a, uh, a, a, con a connection for a robot, an in parallel robot, that will uh, give, uh, which will limit the relative motion between body one and body two to pure translation. If we started off with that arrangement, body two would go to, uh, would move in translation in any direction relative to body one. But as soon as it's moved a little bit, then it'll start to twiddle around and go in all sorts of other directions and not remain parallel to itself because there's no guarantee that we are continuing the parallelism where we need to have it, such as we have with all the other three classes, class A, class B, and, and class C. So um, that then rules out that possibility, and it's, I think it's pretty obvious why we can't put it in. Now... Um, there are, in the paper that I wrote in 1983 on um, uh, the uh, general ideas of, uh, of parallel, in parallel actuated robot arms, structural kinematics of in par parallel actuated robot arms, there are several alternative connections that I've shown uh, not necessarily relevant to the, to the particular matter in hand of pure translational movement being permitted, and that comes up in figure 7, which in fact include ball joints, but you do see later on in the following column on that page, which is page number 709, you will see about three quarters of the way down reference to an R, 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 R connection, which is just the same as this one here. You see there's a single R there, R2, and that is a R, R, no, we got, it, we got it wrong. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We got it wrong. I mean to refer to this one here. Uh, R, uh, R5 on its own, R, R parallel, and R3, R4 parallel. So that, that description in that paper of 1983 could <laughs> easily be said to fit that particular arrangement there. So that then uh, is, is, um, is something that is at least mentioned in general terms in the paper on in parallel actuation dating from 1983. I should emphasize again that dealing with the constant velocity shaft coupling model, uh, when I was working it out, and I think this is pretty plain from the paper that I wrote and was published in 1973, that in order to come up with this general theory, uh, I found that it was important to separate the coupling from the bearings in which the shafts run, these things on the table here. I wanted to look at the coupling on its own and to be able to turn the whole thing around just as if one hand of my hands is body one and the other is body two. I wanted to look precisely at the freedom that this coupling allowed between those two bodies. That point is, I think, made pretty well in that paper written in 1970, or written and published in 1973. Uh, and it's, it was a vital clue to the way in which CV couplings worked and towards getting a general theory for them. 
uh, then when you want to, have, when you've sorted that out, then you can put the shafts in on this. And it's intriguing to see that I could have chosen from this, I could choose any two directions for the shafts, provided they're parallel. Uh, I could shunt one shaft up, up here and the other shaft down there, making them parallel to one another. And that would still work as a constant velocity shaft coupling between those two shafts if they started parallel. It doesn't matter how they stand. One has enormous freedom in terms of the actual arrangements of these joints, and one can come up with all sorts of varieties. There's no reason why one shouldn't, in fact, have a combination of the three chains, a class A chain with a comp B chain and a class C chain. Theoretically, that would work. I don't think anybody would be stupid enough to mix them in that sense, but theoretically there's no reason why you shouldn't have the three chains different from one another, and that as, as, a, as a coupling that would allow pure translation between body one and body two, that would work and give you that precise uh, situation uh, of, of uh, a, pure, a, a pure relative translation, and, and that's all. Uh, I... I'm quite sure that there was nobody before uh, I came up with the paper published in 1973, I was quite sure that nobody had come up with this cluster of designs of constant velocity shaft couplings between parallel shafts. I don't think there was a great deal of originality in the earlier part of that paper where I was dealing with constant velocity shaft couplings between intersecting shafts, but the parallel shaft one came as a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, there were no applications, as far as I know, as shaft couplings at the time, although we did take out a provisional patent in Australia for them. Uh, and the intriguing thing now is that this same structure is manifesting itself in a different context, namely the context of in parallel actuated robots, which of course had not been seriously thought of at all as far back as 1971, uh, which is the date of the patent that we took out, the provisional patent that we took out in Australia before we put, we made any publication of the matter. That provisional patent did lapse for lack of response for anybody who wanted to build a parallel shaft, parallel, a, cup, a, <coughs> a parallel shaft, constant velocity shaft, shaft coupling. Now, I think that has just about covered all the points that I wanted to cover, unless, um, any, unless you have a question or a point yes, here that you'd like to bring up. This, uh, uh, publication from 1983, where you refer to those R, 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 R yeah, <laughs> yes. uh, structure. Could you... Uh, could you draw that again to... Well, I mean, I have drawn an R, 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 R here, haven't I, you see? Yeah, but, but um, that's uh, more your, uh, 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 well, how, how you define it through... Uh, yes, uh, how look... Um, could, could you draw a, a mechanical structure on, on how that would uh, look? Well, if you look at it, just see what, it, what I do say here, because uh, a variant of figure D would be that, uh, and if you look at figure D... What have I got? I've got um, uh, I've got uh, a ball joint in the middle. Yes. Uh, here, with an R joint up here, and I then show that as having a coupling onto something or other up there. And then I have another one coming down here, which also joins into an R, R joint, something like that. And that has a shaft coming off it. Now, uh, I say then that the variant of that, don't I, there's a variant of D could be R, 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 R. Well, um, I could... I could take this one there as R. Um, I could take, I could split the ball joint up into three R's going in three different directions. An X direction, 
a y direction and a z direction. So that gives me three r's equivalent to the ball joint. And I could easily line up uh, the, one of them with this. You see, I could line, line up that one with the z-axis, which essentially gives me r, r. I could line up another one, well, I haven't, the r there. And then these two are shown to be intersecting. I was not, uh, but the, I could regard that as a group in so far as they do intersect. But I could equally well say, all right, what is the difference between intersection at a point which is finite and what is the difference with that and an intersection at a point that is infinitely distant? They're both intersecting, and so therefore by extension, one could say that, that if one is prepared to put that point of intersection between the x and the y axis at infinity, we could say that that ha has something which is comparable to the structure of this one, provided you made the first, the first and the last, uh, uh, last the same. But I don't think it's worth uh, spending too much attention on that because it's rather a long shot from what was in my mind when I wrote R, 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 R whatever I did write down, uh, uh, in that particular context. Uh, it was simply to indicate that where you did have a ball joint, you could always substitute that ball joint with suitably orientated uh, R pairs. And I think that, I don't think there's anything more to it than that. It just happens that the, that, that structure is reminiscent of, of the one that we've been talking about. Okay. I don't think I can really go any, take, take it any further than that. Okay. It does say further on, however, in that same page, that column, at page 4709, the last paragraph, that the 555 entry in column 4 of the table, which is what I referred to earlier, the table being on the previous page, isn't it? Seven, uh, no, two pages earlier, uh, 707, uh, that has attractive possibilities. Well, uh, that's precisely what we found that it has got, has had, yeah. in this particular context. Well, I think then, th I hope that I haven't missed anything out, no. but I think that I have, I hope, given a reasonably clear sort of overall picture of, of the situation uh, and its relevance to the present situation in, in ABB in relation to this development. So mm -hmm. perhaps I shall close here uh, and hope that we don't have to add anything more to it later. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you.